The colonial era was a time in which classification of social groups was paramount but also ambiguous. Whether it be Afro-Latinos adopting cross-cultural religious practices or the identity changes of Catalina de Rousseau, there are many examples of exceptional individuals and communities who contributed to and were impacted by colonialism in different ways. Arguably the most prominent feature of this section is that of the Casta paintings. These paintings, which portray the different racial groups believed to exist in the Americas in this era, tend to be very specific. However, they are not without their faults, and their accuracy does not go unchallenged. It is important to note that these placements are not fixed, even though it was created to be a fixed system that would distinguish between races and classify them into different groups, as race is a very fluid and debated concept, it was not surprising that one could go from one group or one classification to another. One specific example that shows this fluidity is that of the Criollo character. It is no secret that the white Espanol character was the elite in Latin America. They were at the top of the pyramid socially, economically, and politically, mainly if not entirely based on their race. With this in mind, one would assume that any child born of two Espanol parents would also inherit their elite Espanol title. This, however, was not the case for anyone who was a criollo, meaning a child of two European parents born in a region that has been colonized, in this case, Latin America. Even though both their parents are full-blooded Spaniards with quote-unquote sangre limpia and born in Spain, a criollo is not fully Espanol. At the time, in this case, 18th century, in which the Casta paintings took place, Anyone born in Latin America was automatically deemed lesser than those born in Spain. Because of this, the social status of a criollo and their legitimacy as a Spaniard could be up for debate, their birthplace often being an automatic step down in their status. Since the beginning of colonization by the Europeans, race and racial distinctions are issues that have been and continue to be at the forefront of many issues in the Americas. The Casta paintings are just one way of showing how complex race can be. This conundrum can be found elsewhere. The primary documents in Afro-Latino voices, translations of early modern Ibero-Atlantic narratives, shed some light on often overlooked elements of the colonial experience. One such instance is the Palenque del Limon, a clandestine settlement comprised of Africans that had fled from their bondage, known as Maroons. The location was founded in 1580 in the Sierra de Maria, Generally, where there was colonialism, maroon communities existed also. Their existence meant that colonial administrations often negotiated pacts with the maroons, such as is the case in Brazil, Colombia, Cuba, and Ecuador. In this regard, maroon chief Alonso de Eliscas' letter to the crown is insightful in its reveal that maroons dynamically interacted with and were integral to the colonial process. In the vein of Poma and others who've addressed the crown, Ilescas puts to use his rare experience as a muy ladino, which is knowledge of the Spanish language and culture he'd accumulated from his time as a slave. The show's in the writing. I give thanks to God our Father for the many mercies I've received from his most liberal hands and from your lordship. I ordered that we should gather to discuss and communicate what will best serve your royal interest. And so what can be conquered with the indoctrination of the Holy Gospel would only be disservice to God and your majesty, and at the cost of many souls. Thus, I beseech and supplicate your highness, suspend the expedition of soldiers. It will only bring chaos to the peace the devoted father has brought with the Holy Gospel. The letterhead reads, To the most powerful lord, King Don Felipe. Rather than a careless resistance, Ilescas beseeches the Spanish by appealing to their faith and pragmatic interest. More importantly, this is but a look into a wider and ongoing exchange. The one who had transferred the words to paper would likely be a young Trinitarian friar, Alonso de Espinosa. Though Alonso was initially to serve in the military expedition of conquistador Diego Lopez de Zuniga, he would go on to champion the Maroon cause whilst denouncing Zuniga and other conquistadors for their greed. He likely contributed to the diction of Velasquez's missive, but would eventually be punished for his disloyalty. This is but one unique insight into the role of the subjugated in colonial life. There are many others, like Ana de la Cal, who calls herself Lukumi as a way of denoting her status. She was a slaveholder and a morena. But once again, it should be noted that these are just some of the examples, and in fact there are more. What they all suggest is that the colonial experience, tyrannical as it was, 
also contains instances of unforeseen social groups occupying unexpected social positions. What Ilescas, Espinosa, and the others show is that Spanish domination was not one monolithic nor instantaneous result. In the Esmeraldas, the Spanish made over 50 failed attempts to subjugate the area, all the while Ilescas and his Maroons thrived there, alongside other communities, for generations. Furthermore, Ilescas' Maroons allied themselves with some indigenous groups whilst others, such as the Campases, were enemies, and the ensuing mulattoes from these intermarriages eventually grew to take reign of the community. Virtually all social groups are included in a complaint of the Indian, a rare 16th century theatrical piece. The narrative follows a group of indigenous Americans who are traveling to Europe to object to their abuse in the New World. The tribunal is presided over by archetypal characters such as Death. The characters of Death and St. Augustine insist to keep working and bear the suffering, and that the indigenous can only hope for justice in the afterlife. Even St. Dominic, who is supposed to be a Lascasian character and therefore on the side of the indigenous, places less emphasis on the greed of the Spaniards and more towards the corrupting nature of the New World. The play ends without resolving the petition of the indigenous. But despite this somber epilogue, the complaint of the Indians in the court of death provides an emic and allegorical view into the most vivid debates of that day. From the colonizer's perspective, we recognize that the destruction and slain were brought upon by the Spaniards, in which further commences us to ponder this occurrence, as well as ask ourselves why these events took place. Colonial expansion under the Spanish Empire was initiated by the Spanish conquistadors and developed by the monarchy of Spain through its administrators and missionaries. Trade, as well as the propagation of the Christian religion through indigenous conversations were the reasons behind the colonial expansion. The reason for which the Christians have killed and obliterated so numerous and such endless quantities of spirits have been primarily to get their definitive end, the Indians' gold as well as to accumulate a substantial amount of wealth and to raise themselves to a high estate. Subsequent to having slain all those who might yearn toward or suspire after or think of freedom or consider escaping from the torments that they are made to suffer, by which I mean all the native born lords and adult males, for it is the Spaniards custom in their wars to allow only young boys and females to live, being to oppress them with the hardest, harshest, and most heinous bondage. In the Testament of Las Casas, it states, I have great hope that the Empire and King of Spain, our Lord Don Carlos V of that name, may come to the understand, for until now, the truth has always been most industrially covered over. The acts of mal malice and treachery, which have been and still are being done upon those nations and lands against the will of God and his own, and that he may bring an end to so many evils and bring relief to that new world which God has given him, as a lover and cultivator as he is of justice. <laughs>